Well, hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Pinkham, and I'm the Exhibition and Engagement Coordinator for the Main Library Gallery at the University of Iowa Libraries. Today's talk comes to you from Iowa City, so I'd like to express our gratitude and respect to the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk Nations and all other Indigenous peoples who have inhabited this place. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today to learn about the Fall 2023 gallery exhibit, Hey Buddy, I'm Bill, which was curated by Jen Knights and Brad Ferrier. And for those who haven't had a chance to visit, the main library gallery is located on the first floor of the main library, as one might expect. Our exhibit team produces a new exhibit each semester for which guest curators from across campus are selected to use storytelling and our archives and materials at the UI libraries to share uh, an area of their expertise with our community. Hey Buddy, I'm Bill. We'll close in the gallery on December 19th, but you can also check out the virtual tour, which is coming very soon. And today's talk is presented by Jen Knights and Brad Ferrier, and they'll share a bit about the amazing life and uh, of legendary Iowa City and Bill Sachter and their experience curating an exhibit celebrating him. And while not everything about Bill's story is represented in the exhibit, we hope it will inspire you to go learn a little bit more about him for yourselves. Jen Knights is the Marketing and Communications Manager for Performing Arts at Iowa, and prior to this role, she was the Marketing and Community Engagement Specialist for the University of Iowa School of Social Work, where she managed Wild Bills in North Hall for four years. Jen currently serves on several campus committees, and this year was a recipient of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences DEI Award. Jen started this exhibit project in 2021, a couple years ago, when she submitted an exhibit proposal to our gallery advisory team, and it was selected to move into production for 2023. And as part of her research for this exhibit, Jen initiated the acquisition of many bill-related materials for special collections and archives um, from the School of Social Work and from Barry and Bev Morrow, our dear friends here at the libraries. And Brad Ferrier is a digital projects librarian for special collections and archives at the University of Iowa Libraries. He earned his master's degree in library and information science from Iowa and a graduate certificate in book studies and book arts from the UI Center for the Book in 2013. Brad's a member of the Campus-Wide Council on Disability Awareness and the UI Libraries Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Social Justice Council. He's a strong and action-oriented advocate for accessibility in the libraries and across campus. It's really been a pleasure working with both Jen and Brad on this exhibit, and both have brought their vital expertise and skills to this project. So thank you to you both for all of your hard work. And we also like to thank everyone who contributed to this exhibit, particularly some of Bill's best buddies who shared with us many of their mementos, photos, and stories of life with their, with their good friend. We can never thank you enough. So the curators will have some time for questions after their talk, but welcome to Jen and Brad. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks everybody um, who is here in the room with us today. Um, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to talk about this exhibit and how it came to be. Um, it's been a delightful experience. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, um, and Sarah, if you don't mind going to the next slide, um, I started, I initiated this exhibit when I was working in the School of Social Work um, and overseeing Wild Bill's Coffee Shop. Um, I wanted to share a few pictures from the history there um, because I was managing Wild Bill's, which was still even um, decades after Bill Sachter had passed. Um, employing community members with disabilities and serving faculty, staff, and students in North Hall. Um, coffee of <laughs> varying quality and strength and um, uh, potency, but we, we had a lot of fun there. So this is uh, me in the top left image with Jonathan, one of our employees. And then at the bottom, um, Ben and also Jordan, who was one of our social work students who managed the coffee shop. Um, in the top right, you can see that as part of my history, I actually met Barry Morrow back in 2013. And this was actually before I even started working in the School of Social Work. So it kind of seemed like it was maybe just always meant to be. Um, however, in 2020, uh, as many things had to close because of the pandemic, we also had to close the coffee shop at that time. And we already had been talking about changing the model of, of what we did in Wild Bill's um, to make sure that we are in, continuing to have a great impact in the community and, um, you know, making a good experience for folks with disabilities that we were trying to connect with and serve. Um, the coffee shop had actually become not very busy even before the pandemic, um, just a proliferation of coffee shops and other options here on campus and close by. 
Um, so the folks who were working with us in the coffee shop were getting kind of lonely and understimulated. So we decided to really focus on the space as a learning space for classrooms, for media production. Um, and as we made that pivot, we decided that it was really important to tell the story of Bill and his history, even as we um, wouldn't be opening the coffee shop anymore. Um, so at that time, we realized that having worked with lots of folks with disabilities, his story, the story of Bill Sachter, um, being taken from his family when he was a child, being institutionalized, that was actually something that was happening um, with many, many, many people in America at that time. Um, so what made his story super unique was actually the fact that it was told. And that's like the beauty of um, Barry Morrow coming into his life, um, not only making space for him and becoming a friend to Bill, but then sharing the true story of Bill's life with other people. Um, just a note here on this first slide that I did add a few of these little arrows to point out things that you might see in images in the slides that are actually things that you can also see in the exhibit if you're able to visit in person. So um, this sign that Ben is holding here, Ben and Jordan are holding is actually also featured in the exhibit. Next slide, please. Go ahead, Brad. Um, I also never met Bill Sachter. Uh, in fact, I was just six years old when Bill passed away. I was living in Indiana uh, and was too young to remember seeing the movie Bill on TV. Uh, the first time I ever heard of Bill Sachter was when I visited Wild Bill's coffee shop in North Hall. I was a grad school a grad student in library school and taking classes at the Center for the Book, which is also in North Hall. I remember seeing pictures of Bill in the coffee shop, like this one, which is currently hanging in the exhibit. I knew that the coffee shop employed people with disabilities. I knew that Bill was among those employed in the past, but that's really all I knew. Um, several years later, I became friends with uh, Jen uh, through our work on the um, Council for Dis uh, on Disability Awareness. Uh, Jen was at the School of Social Work and managing Wild Bills at the time. Uh, she screened a couple of films there, one of which was the documentary A Friend Indeed, The Bill Sachter Story. Uh, that's when I realized um, that's when I really learned about Bill, uh, his remarkable story, uh, Barry Morrow, Tom Waltz, um, and why he was so significant to so many. Uh, when Jen asked for my help in telling Bill's story for this exhibit, uh, I, mean, I immediately said yes without hesitation. Uh, it was important to tell his story again because there are fewer and fewer people who know the name Bill Sachter. Uh, it was also important, as Jen pointed out, to preserve and archive these materials. Uh, this is exhibit could introduce or reintroduce Bill to a community uh, on which he had a profound impact. Uh, I've come to realize that this is, exhibit is as much about friends and community as it is about Bill. I also realized that I could relate to part of Bill's story. Uh, weeks after I finished grad school, um, I had a stroke. Um, I could not walk or speak. I did recover mostly. Uh, I have hemiparesis and aphasia because of the stroke. Uh, I temporarily moved back to Fort Wayne, Indiana, my hometown, to be closer to my family. Then when some time had passed and I was looking to volunteer, uh, I couldn't really find any place to work there. So I made this decision to come back to Iowa City. Um, when I came back, I started taking the bus to get around. I started volunteering at places that I previously worked as a student, conservation and preservation here at the main library uh, and at the art library and at the Stanley Museum of Art. This is the part of Bill's story that I can relate to. 
having friends that helped me to move, some of them twice, uh, friends that helped me navigate getting around on the bus, uh, having friends who gave me the opportunity to volunteer, giving me purpose, uh, and who fought uh, and persuaded to get the job that I have currently. So I'm happy to tell this, the story of this man who, was, who had the opportunity to become everybody's buddy. Um, before we, we move on, I like to point out that we may use language that may be troubling today. Uh, language evolves over time, reflecting shifts in understanding and attitudes. Some outdated terms seen throughout the ex exhibition were commonly, commonly used to describe uh, psychological conditions and practices related to mental health. Uh, as society's knowledge about mental health continues to advance, it's crucial that language reflects this process. Compassionate and person-centered language can create an environment of understanding, support, and inclusivity for people, for individuals facing mental health challenges. Um, now I'll turn it over to Jen and she can uh, tell me about Bill Sactor. Yeah, so um, as Sarah indicated and also Brad, um, many of you in this webinar might not know Bill's story at all. We, there are probably a number of you who know it very well. Um, so we wanted to start by just giving a really basic overview of Bill's story as we know it. Um, for those of you who are not acquainted and for those of you who know it well, um, this is just a glancing blow. Of course, we can't tell a man's whole life story in just the space of a webinar. And that was, of course, one of the challenges of the exhibit itself was um, sort of taking on the task of telling such an important story of a complex and nuanced um, person in the world, um, just with objects in a room. <laughs> so bear with us, but we wanted to just give you a brief overview of what his life, what his story that we're trying to tell um, was. Uh, so he actually started off in the Twin Cities, um, and we can go to the next slide, Sarah. He was born in 1913 to Russian immigrants who were living in Minneapolis at the time. Um, Sam and Mary Sachter ran a grocery store, and in 1920, Sam, his father, died in the flu epidemic. Um, so Bill was a kid with a couple of older sisters, and he was just seven years old, um, lost his dad, and his family is living in poverty at this time. They did own a grocery store, but um, at that time, those neighborhood grocery stores were just very small operations, um, and they lived above the store. Um, without very much. So um, Bill was struggling in school. He was removed from his classes when he was classified as subnormal in one of these um, IQ tests that was pretty prevalent at the time, um, whose accuracy is kind of questionable in our current lens. Um, we feel like if this boy had been growing up in America in this day and age, that he may have received some interventions and supports that might have helped him catch up or keep up with his classmates. Um, knowing that he had lost a parent, was living in poverty, and may have had also a language barrier, um, it's no wonder that he was struggling a little bit at that time. The response of the state at that time was actually to remove him from his family and place him in a mental institution in Faribault, Minnesota, that was then called the Minnesota School for the Feeble-Minded. So he entered that institution when he was eight years old. Um, he was among a population that included people of all ages and every imaginable disability. So while he was just considered to be um, subnormal intellectually, he was in there with people who had psychosis, um, people who had epilepsy, um, people who had all different kinds of physical disabilities um, and generally just did not receive schooling or care as a, as a child um, from that point forward. And he ended up being kept in Faribault for 44 years. 
So then when he was released from Faribault in September of 1964, so we just passed the, um, what is that, the 50, 60 year anniversary, almost of that, 59. Um, he was living in the Twin Cities and just kind of turned out. He did, he did live in a boarding house, some sort of a halfway house. Um, he had some odd jobs that he did to support himself. But at this time, this was happening to lots of folks in America. There was a trend toward deinstitutionalization, um, which was the recognition that people didn't belong in these institutions against their will. There was an attempt to let them be free and live lives like normal people, but there were really not that many supports for them. So something that Barry uh, Morrow has talked about often um, is the fact that lots of folks who got out of institutions and went into the especially big cities just kind of got lost, um, whether they died or ended up in prison or um, just abused and, and, and treat, mistreated in other ways. That was something that could have happened to Bill, but part of the reason that it didn't is that he actually met Bev Morrow in the Twin Cities, um, working at a country club, scrubbing pots. Bev was a cocktail waitress that befriended him and helped him out with making phone calls and um, just sort of learning how to be a person in the world. And he eventually also met Bev's husband, Barry Morrow, at a staff Christmas party at the country club. So he had been waving at Barry um, when Barry would come to pick Bev up from work late at night from the window of the kitchen. And when he saw Barry at the Christmas party, he marched right up to him and stuck out his hand and said, hey, buddy, I'm Bill. And that's the first time they officially met face to face, but they became friends from that part forward. Um, and he actually then Barry and Bev and their friends made space for him in their lives. Um, you can see there's a great picture here from a party where band was playing that um, Barry was in or his friends were in. Um, they often would get Bill up on the stage and let him play harmonica. And Bill just really enjoyed being part of a social group and being out in the world. So the next thing that happened then was that Barry, who had um, met a social work professor in the Twin Cities when he was doing some volunteering and going to college and sort of figuring out life. Um, that professor was Tom Walls and Tom Walls was hired here at the University of Iowa to be the director of the School of Social Work. So he ended up offering Barry a job here in Iowa City and Bev and Barry moved here to take that job. Um, at that time, they actually left Bill behind because Bill was still a ward of the state um, so they came to Iowa City without Bill um, and started their lives here. But then not very much later, uh, Bill had a health emergency and they were kind of his only family. Um, so they ended up becoming his legal guardians and bringing him to Iowa City to join them here with their, their children as well. Um, Bill needed a thing to do. He needed a task. Um, a, an, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He needed a vocation. So um, they eventually figured out that he could make coffee for the students and faculty in the School of Social Work. And they set up a little coffee shop for him in a faculty lounge, which students eventually um, called Wild Bill's Coffee Shop. And just a side note, my background here is an image of the inside of Wild Bill's Coffee Shop at North Hall that was taken um, when I was still working there and before some recent um, uh, remodeling. But Bill became a beloved member of the community here in Iowa City. He ended up moving into his own room in a place, um, a boarding house run by a delightful lady named Mae Driscoll. You can see images of her and his housemates in the exhibit as well. Um, so he was having a, a really good life. He was working at Wild Bills. He was well-loved in the community. Um, the children in the preschool in North Hall loved him and so did all the kids around town. Uh, he had his own place and he would ride the bus to and from work. May Driscoll would make his lunches and his dinners, and he really um, had a great life here in Iowa City. So then, um, because of all of that, he became kind of a local celebrity, and the social work students in the School of Social Work had started to urge Barry, who was now his guardian and arguably his best friend, to write down um, our, uh, Bill's story, to sort of uh, capture it. And they wanted to nominate Bill for the Handicapped Iowan of the Year Award. So they engaged Barry's help in helping to write that nomination. Um, 
which that award had never been given before to someone with an intellectual disability. Uh, most of the history of that award was uh, kind of businessmen in wheelchairs. So people who had physical disabilities, um, but this was the first time that it had gone to someone who had an intellectual, perceived intellectual disability. So you can see the yellow arrows here because we do have that Handicapped Iowan of the Year award plaque in the exhibit. He did win that award. Um, we have at least a scan of the Des Moines Register paper where Bill's story or Barry's story that he wrote about Bill called Bill's Triumph was published on the front page um, of the Sunday paper, I should say. Um, and then also he, uh, as the, during his time here in Iowa City, he was able to be bar mitzvahed when he was, I believe, 66 years old. Um, so this is kind of a demonstration of some of the things that being in the institution took away from him as a child. Um, you know, when he was 13 years old, he did not get to have his bar mitzvah at that time. But later when they discovered that he was Jewish, when Barry discovered that in the paperwork and he let Bill know that he was Jewish, and invited him um, to ask him if he'd like to learn more. Well, he absolutely did want to learn more. And so um, we have a little arrow pointing at the yarmulke here in this picture. We don't have that fancy yarmulke. I sure wish we did, but we do have one that's in the exhibit that um, was donated by or sent to us by the Maros for the exhibit that was more of an everyday yarmulke that, that Bill um, may have worn during his life. Um, so that story on the Bill's Triumph story that got him the award and was on the Des Moines Register also, and I'll skip a lot of the details here, but it got made into a movie um, called Bill that Barry wrote the screenplay for. So that was released in 1981. It aired on network TV. And, and it, in 1981, if you had something that aired on network TV on a Sunday evening, you better believe that just about everybody in the country was watching it. Um, so not only did it win a number of awards, but it also um, really shifted the views of people in America about people with disability. Um, it was probably the first movie that that was created here in America and maybe in the world um, that featured a hero, a main protagonist who is a person with disability, um, who was not a person who was made out to be a buffoon or a villain or someone scary but actually was a complex character that you cared about and were rooting for. So that was a huge um, difference um, in terms of representation in the movies. And uh, eventually Barry went on to have a successful career in Hollywood. He wrote Bill on his own, which was kind of a sequel to Bill and eventually went on to also write the movie Rain Man, um, which was also featuring uh, the main hero as being a person who had disability. So if you haven't seen that one, check it out as well. Finally, um, he also, there was a documentary made about Bill's life called A Friend Indeed, the Bill Sactor story. Um, this, if you haven't seen it, this documentary actually is uh, largely a lot of firsthand captured material from Bill's life by, captured by Barry Morrow. Um, as a multimedia specialist, that was his job in the School of Social Work. And um, throughout his friendship with Bill in the Twin Cities, he was just often photographing and filming and audio recording um, Bill and his other friends just because it was something that he loved to do. He was fascinated by it. So eventually he had all of this raw material. Um, when the, the made for TV movie got made, he had actually wanted to make a documentary, but he ended up um, being convinced to do a based on a true story TV movie, and he always held it in his in his head, in his heart, that he wanted a documentary to be made. So eventually, he connected with Lane Wyrick, who was the son of Daryl Wyrick, who is the head of the University of Iowa Foundation, um, to create the documentary. Lane was a filmmaker, and he basically took all of this wonderful raw material that Barry had captured, um, recorded new interviews with um, some of the closest people to Bill, including Barry and Bev, but also a number of other folks who were his best buddies in the world. Um, we actually have a panel in the exhibit called Best Buddies that kind of talks about some of those other friends of his. Um, so uh, that movie is also available on YouTube to be watched absolutely for free. Um, if you want to follow up by watching that or if you want to revisit it and you've seen it in the past. Um, we, so on our exhibit website we also have links to that movie so um check it out 
there's so much more to his story than what we can tell today. But that is a really um, high level view of the story that we are trying to tell in this exhibit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how, how we put the exhibit together. Go ahead, Brad. So many B names. <laughs> Oh, I think you've got your mute button on. Okay, uh, since Jen did the story of Bill, um, I took it upon myself uh, to research other questions such as uh, what would Bill have experienced if he had grown up in Iowa? Um, and were there any people doing advocacy work uh, locally? Um, in the exhibit, you can see a map that has the institutes that were much like Fairbow um, in the state of Iowa. Uh, there were two here in Iowa City. Uh, the first I will mention is the Iowa Psychopathic Hospital, which is thought to be the first university-affiliated psychiatric department west of the Mississippi. Um, it was later known as the uh, Psychiatric Hospital and became part of the University of, Hosp uh, University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics in 1976 and subse subsequently moved to the Papa John Pavilion in the main University Hospital uh, in 1991. You can go on to the next slide. Uh, the other uh, is the Johnson County Poor Farm and Asylum. It was located on the, it is located on the outskirts of Iowa City and Melrose Avenue. A portion of it still exists and has been restored as part of the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm. Uh, each county in Iowa had a poor farm and the tradition is well represented by the uh, Johnson County Poor Farm, which may be the only uh, remaining intact example. Uh, the history of the Johnson County Historical Poor Farm in 1855, Johnson County procured 160 acres of land to establish a poor farm. Um, in 1859, the first asylum was built, which was used as a hog house uh, and, and a future point in time. In 1886, three new buildings were built, one for its administration, a second for the poor, and a third for the mentally insane. Uh, by 1964, a facility replacing these 1886 buildings, the uh, Johnson County uh, operated the poor farm um, uh, operated the farm under the poor farm model until 1988. Currently, uh, Chatham Oaks Residential Care Facility operates the space. Uh, these farms were established as a result of the 19th century social reform movement. Uh, under this model, local governments established farms to house people who were poor unfortunates. Uh, the elderly with no relatives to care for them, immigrants, widows, orphans, and people with disabilities. From the or earliest days, inmates were expected to do farm chores to the extent of their abilities. The farm was to be self supporting and the labor of the inmates would help compensate the county for their care. <clears throat> uh, the farm produced a mix of corn, wheat, hay, oats, potato, cabbage, tobacco, and it also included an orchard, uh, orchard uh, vegetable gardens, and dairy cows. Residents would include or, Residents' work included tending to livestock and maintaining the gardens. Uh, the farm pox 
products were consumed by residents and sold to customers to fund day-to-day -day expenses of the facility. Um, there are firsthand accounts of individuals who felt at home on the floor farm. Uh, there are also accounts of relatives who went off to the poor farm. Others were undoubtedly forced to live and to work there against their will. Uh, the article, Hog House, reflects years of horror for and stain uh, from the Cedar Rapids Gazette in August, 20, August 20th, uh, 1981, describes a report written by the Division of Historic Preservation concerning the historical significance of the insane asylum. The building represents a moving and thought-provoking glimpse into the history of mental health care, not only in the county, but in the state and the nation. The fact is, the fact that it's still ex in existence and essentially unchanged is very important because as attitudes toward the mentally ill and methods of care have changed over the past century, uh, most communities have made haste to remove the vestiges of the inhuman conditions in which the 19th century insane persons were kept. It further stated that treatment was non-existent heat provided only by a small stove in the hallway and the amount of physical care administered uh, here was probably more than that given to the hogs who occupied the structure years later. Uh, today, the 1859 First Johnson County Asylum is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and has been restored. You can visit the Johnson County Historical Site. You can schedule uh, with the Johnson County Historical Society to visit the asylum and several other restored historic buildings, a livestock barn, uh, a dairy barn, and the surrounding uh, grounds, including a uh, cemetery with unmarked graves where many of the people who died at the farm and asylum are buried. The State Historical Society, the Johnson County Historical Society, and the Johnson County recorder, Kim Painter, were very helpful in researching the treatment of people with disabilities in the poor farm and the records they kept. In the recorder's office, there are several ledgers from uh, the supplies um, sold by the farm and some patient information and details, including how they came to be at the facility, uh, their record of treatment, uh, what, they, what happened to them when they left. Uh, in some cases, it showed uh, that they were moved to a different facility or released. Much of this research did not make it into the final uh, exhibit because scope and because of wanting to predict the names of individuals referred to in these ledgers. You can go to the next slide. Uh, Tom Harkin was um, the first person that comes to mind for a lot of folks who think about Iowa and disability right advocates. Uh, Tom Harkin, Senator Tom Harkin was elected to Congress in 1974. Uh, as a young Senator, Tom was tapped by Senator Ted Kennedy to craft uh, legislation to protect uh, the civil rights of Americans with physical and mental disabilities. Uh, what merged from that process would later become his signature, signature legislative achievement, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, on July 13th um, of 19, uh, 
uh, upon the upon the ADA's passage, uh, Harkin delivered a speech to Congress in American Sign Language. It was uh, addressed to his brother Frank, who is deaf. His um, his message for Frank and the countless others who had felt discrimination. Uh, Congress opens the door to all Americans with disabilities. Today we say no to ignorance, no to fear, no to prejudices. prejudices. Um, Frank, who is deaf from a young age, was sent to what was then called the Iowa School for the Deaf and Dumb in Council Bluffs. Uh, this is just a side note that the Asylum for the Blind and the School for Deaf and Dumb were both started in Iowa City in 1853 and 1854, respectively. Um, the Iowa School for the Blind was moved to Benton, Iowa in 1862. The Iowa School for the Deaf, as it is now known, uh, moved to Council Bluffs in 1870. Frank always told me I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb, um, Harkin has said in the past. But societal expectations of deaf people uh, severe, severely limited their career opportunities. Yeah. I knew he had unlimited potential, but he fe faced huge barriers. It wasn't Frank's disability that held him back but the physical and attitudinal barriers uh, that people with disabilities face. Um, I went to Drake University in Des Moines to do some of the research. I met with Hope Bibens, uh, the director of the University Archives and Special Collections there, and spent the day looking through the Harkin collection of legislative working files and speeches. I su suspect that Senator Harkin and Bill had crossed paths at some point. I think that Hope Bibens thought there must have been some meeting of the two. Um, I haven't found anything. Uh, unfortunately, due to other, uh, due to timing and other restrictions, we did not get some things I wanted for the exhibit, including this a medal he received from uh, President Bush in 1994. You can go to the next slide. Another advocate that I wanted uh, want to talk about is Elizabeth Reese and her daughter, Sarah. I want to thank Anna Howland and her blog post from the Iowa Women's Archive entitled um, Disability Rights in the Elizabeth Reese Papers, much of where this information is taken from. Uh, Elizabeth Reese, born in 1937, was a teacher, educator, and advocate for services with uh, for people disabled people. Our own daughter, Sarah, was born with Down syndrome in 1972. Reese quickly realized how few resources for parents uh, of children with Down syndrome. When looking for information, she found an article published in a popular, popular newspaper from a doctor discussing his encouragement of people to euthanize their children born with Down syndrome, as the only other option was institutionalizing the child. Uh, Reese went against the odds and created her own programs and resources and decided to raise her daughter at home. Um, Sarah would later be among the first students um, with disabilities to be integrated into the Iowa City a public school system. The story was meaningful because it happened in Iowa City, uh, but also because of the parallels it has with Bill's story. Uh, Elizabeth Reese would continue her advocacy, uh, becoming the president of the Association for Retired Citizens of Johnson County, 
from 1977 to 1982. Uh, she traveled to Osaka, Japan to speak about disability resources and programs um, with some of those programs being implemented in Japanese schools. You can go to the next slide. Jen? Yeah, so um, it's really interesting that the research approach for Brad was kind of looking into um, these banks of historical materials, both here at the University of Iowa in special collections and archives, and then also elsewhere in the state. Um, my experience with the curating the exhibit um, and telling the Bill Sachter part of the story was kind of um, reaching back into just uh, uh, learning the story while I was managing the coffee shop and then connecting with um, the Morrows as, as part of that whole process of closing the coffee shop, changing the, um, the format of it and reaching out to them to communicate about that change. Um, we knew that that was an important part of their history and that they were an important part of its history. So when we decided to change the format, um, we sort of connected at that time. And then the discussion of actually archiving the materials that we had in the School of Social Work that had been displayed in Wild Bills um, and nearby in North Hall um, had begun. We thought if we're not going to have the coffee shop, perhaps we should be thinking about um, donating these things to archives, making sure that they're stabilized, that they are available for future people. And in talking with Barry about that, he actually said, you know, we have a bunch of stuff out here in Santa Barbara that you might be interested in as well. Um, and so our initial thing was actually about getting the materials that we had in the School of Social Work that had come from Tom Walls's collection that ha had just been passed around or stored in the basement of North Hall for many years, um, wanting to make sure that they were preserved and cataloged. Um, but then also realizing that there were additional materials that could be brought here um, and wanting to tell that story to a new group of people who hadn't heard it before. Um, I decided with some encouragement from Dean Sarah Sanders, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, um, to propose the uh, Wild Bills exhibit for the main library gallery. Um, and that was back in 2021 after having been in conversation with Barry and Bev for a number of months um, and also engaging with John Colshaw, the university librarian. And at the time it was the previous university archivist, David McCartney, but then also moving on to um, Sarah when she joined us here. So over the last couple of years, the library staff and development staff from the UI Center for Advancement also have really been engaged with Barry and Bev um, and visited them out in California reviewed their items um, to help sort of figure out like what would make sense for our collection and for the exhibit and, and how all those arrangements would get made. Um, so that was kind of a long process that was started off way back in, in the first half of 2021. And then it was just such an exciting time um, earlier this spring as we had been curating items out of the existing collections um, of special collections in the archives to also be receiving new items that would that may also enter the permanent collection, but things that we were receiving in boxes from California that we could kind of unbox and review with all of Barry's notes um, and kind of curating from a whole brand new supply as it was coming in as well. Um, so that was a pretty exciting process. And I think probably a little bit unorthodox compared to some of the other ways that library gallery exhibits have been curated in the past. Um, so out of the things that came from special collections and from the archives, Brad and I each have some particular favorites that we wanted to sort of do a little show and tell with you about items that are in the exhibit that are particularly meaningful. Um, and then we wanna allow a f at least a few minutes for some questions. So I think we'll go, by, go through these pretty quickly. Um, Brad, do you wanna start? Yeah, uh, the first group of items I wanted to talk about are the bus passes and notes to the bus drivers that he carried with him to help navigate Iowa City. 
uh, from the stories that I've heard, Bill was always on time. Uh, in fact, he was often early. Uh, he could not tell time, as I understand. It, this was, this is just a story. Um, I don't know if it's accurate or not. He knew it was morning. He'd wake up in a chair that was seated next to a window when the sun came up. He would always get dressed the night before. Um, he would follow his morning routine, eat breakfast, go out to wait on the bus. Um, this is a picture of him waiting on the bus uh, near the um, near his house on Ewell Street. Uh, the notes he carried in his wallet or pocket for the bus drivers to let them know where he was headed and when he was to get off the bus. For From what I understand, this was not always the case. He would sometimes or maybe often get off at the wrong stop uh, maybe the bus driver was unfamiliar with him. Um, who knows why? Um, when he first started riding, riding the bus in Iowa City, Barry would follow the bus in his car and to pick Bill up if he got off the wrong place. Uh, eventually, uh, probably right away, he made friends with fellow riders um, and he would talk to them and uh, play his harmonica for anyone on the bus. I remember coming back to Iowa City uh, and taking the bus for the first time uh, since I was a grad student. I did not come from the city with reliable and dependable uh, public, public transit system. I was nervous. I was able to speak somewhat, but I was still uncertain. I had to get to the library or the museum or to the doctor's office. Those notes uh, written to the bus driver uh, would have been very helpful. Uh, these are worn, uh, indicating that he had them in his pockets or and they had been used, I assume. Then the next slide. Uh, this is a notebook with Bill's handwriting. Uh, Bill never learned to read or write in Faribo. He got um, help to write his mother a few times that he did. Uh, the reason he met Bev Morrow was that he couldn't dial a phone. Uh, he was made to work instead of going to school. Uh, people later on in his life tried to teach him to read and write. He did learn to write his name, kind of. He sort of wrote, he wrote B-L-L -L often with a dot over the middle L. This was to save ink, uh, he was supposed to, supposedly known to say. Uh, these items, the cards for the bus drivers and the notebook, have a special meaning for me. I was a bit overwhelmed when I first came across these in scrapbooks that came over from the School of Social Work. I thought back to after my stroke when I was relearning to speak, relearning to walk, uh, and use my non-dominant hand because of the hemiparesis on my right side. I have examples of my own, a notebook, uh, worksheets, crosswords, and other kinds of word puzzles, uh, audio recordings. I remember how difficult it was and how frustrating it was to know what I wanted to say, but the words were lost. Now looking back at these things, I can see how much I have improved. This is not really about Bill, but an example of how I can relate to a story. These are just um, some of the thoughts that came up from my own experiences when I found these items. Looking back, a community of friends uh, played a significant role. You can go on to the next slide. <clears throat> So I wanted to point out a couple of my favorite artifacts or items from the exhibit are actually some of the biggest ones. Um, these are a couple of the things that kind of represent the interior of the coffee shop to me. And as you can see, uh, we kind of set up a little diorama or like a little mini coffee shop inside the exhibit um, gallery. And so you can see some items on the right in the front window, including that sign that we saw earlier 
plus a bun coffee maker, which is the same kind that you can see pictured in the exhibit that Bill would make coffee with, that we still were making coffee with. Maybe not the exact same coffee maker, but the same kind um, when I worked there. There's also on the right here, you can see a mannequin with overalls and a Hawaiian shirt and an engineer's cap, which is kind of hard to see in the picture. But these were actually items of clothing that we um, had in the archives from Bill Sachter. I believe that were from the Tom Walls collection. Um, but we also got a hat, at least one hat and overalls from the Moros. So I'm not sure exactly which. Um, I'm sure that the card probably says where these came from, um, but just really personal items that connected directly with Bill as a person because he was well known to wear overalls and hats almost at all times. Um, on the left is the beauty bar, which actually was not something that was in the coffee shop while Bill was there, but came in later as one of Tom Walls's um, kind of acquisitions of old furniture that got fixed up and, and repurposed in the coffee shop. This thing on the left here, the beauty bar, was actually functioned as the counter that we would do our transactions over in the coffee shop when, when I joined there. And it had been there for um, many years at that point in time, probably since the 80s. Um, one of the, uh, you can go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, another favorite of mine is this wig of bills that we have in the exhibit. You can see on the panel behind the wig, there's actually a picture of Bill posing with his sort of wig collection and stand. Um, the reason I love this one is because it's actually uh, very, also very personal. Um, Bill was rarely seen without a wig or a hat um, throughout his lifetime. And that all sort of traces back to um, a violent incident that happened to him in the Faribault Institution, which he had he was able to share that story to some extent with Barry. Barry Morrow has shared it with us that he lost some hair in that incident. Um, and it always made him very self-conscious and ashamed, um, which is unfortunate since it wasn't something that he had done wrong. But he always said that a good man has to have good hair. And so um, he, he definitely came out of the institution with a very ill-fitting wig, kind of like this one that we have on display that was donated by Barry. Um, sent to us from California. In fact, I remember unboxing that one. Um, the first photo here of Bill in the middle um, actually shows kind of what he looked like when he came out of the institution around the time that Barry and Bev met him. So terribly ill-fitting wig. He was overweight. He had a goiter. He had almost no teeth. Um, and then this last picture just showing him like in the coffee shop space with a much better wig. He's smiling. He's now got the big fuzzy beard that he was well known for. Um, and and well dressed, a fashionable a fashionable man at the end there. Um, I also wanted to point out that in the exhibit we have the actual Emmy that Barry won for the movie Bill and the screenwriting there. Um, we have the Lucky Piece two dollar bill that is well known to be something that Bill carried around in his pocket. Um, the story says that Bill attributed the two dollar bill, his Lucky Piece somehow with his ability to get out of the institution. He also somehow gave it credit for being a um, world-class harmonica player. Um, and so this is a really beautiful emblem of some of those stories. Also, it's uh, been told by Barry a number of times, and you can hear him tell it in the documentary, um, that when Barry and Bev decided to move to California, they invited Bill to come with them at that time. And this was... Um, when Barry or Bill was living on his own with Mae Driscoll, he was working at the coffee shop. And he said, you know, no, I, I don't need to go to California with you. I have a good life here. I'm needed. I'm important here. And he um, reportedly pulled that $2 bill out of his pocket and gave it to Barry and said, um, if you're going to California, you're going to need this more than I do. So I love that story. We also obviously have a couple of um, Bill's harmonicas on display in the exhibit. And um, this other, the other thing I wanted to point out is this top picture in the middle is actually showing our display um, about the documentary film. Um, you can see the movie poster on the right there, a little bit of information about Lane Wyrick and how he came to make this film. And then I just want to say thank you to Lane um, because he made a special edit of the documentary a short version of it just for the exhibit that plays on a loop in the exhibit. Um, just really showing some of the best footage of just Bill being Bill in the world. 
um, and some of the stories that Barry has told. Um, so if you ever get to visit that, you can, you can um, view that right there in the space. Um, finally, just wanted to say thank you. I'm not sure, but I think that maybe some of our far-flung um, friends, our buddies, Barry, Bev, maybe um, possibly Jack Debke and some other folks might be on the call today. Um, it was just such a delight to have Barry and Bev visit us here in Iowa City <clears throat> for the exhibit opening just a, a few, a handful of weeks ago. So here they are in the exhibit with Brad and me. Um, you, can, <laughs> you can see Barry on the screen behind Barry um, through the beauty bar, which is kind of a delightful image. Um, so that was their visit here. And then as part of that visit, they also, um, you know, visited a classroom in the School of Social Work. Um, Barry talked to a class there, I think also in the Communication Studies program, he talked with some students. Um, Barry and Bev got to visit our conservation lab in Special Collections, um, which is that bottom left image there, visiting with some library staff about the work they do there. Um, the middle picture here at the top is actually a stop that Barry made into the School of Social Work and in Wild Bills, where he recorded a, an episode of the Wild Bills Cup of Social Justice podcast, which I co-host with Stephen Cummings, who's on faculty at the School of Social Work. Um, that podcast episode is actually just about to be released. I think Tuesday is when it's due out. Um, and he also did a Q&A and a screening of Rain Man at Film Scene at that time. Um, so delightful visit. We had just a wonderful time around the exhibit and um, we are more than happy to answer a few questions now. We have just a few minutes left um, if anyone um, has anything for us. <laughs> 